Hey guys, welcome back to Corsetta Nursing. Today we're going to go over ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. We're going to go over all the things you'll need to know about for your nursing exam and the NCLEX. We're going to go over the pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, risk factors, complications, management, and your nursing intervention. So let's get right into it. Now, if you guys have watched my courses before, we always mention it. Make sure you guys go to CorsettaNursing.com to get your free pathophysiology constant map that it can allow you to take notes directly with this course. Pathophysiology constant map will allow you to categorize how you want to take notes. So that way you can best apply it to your nursing exam questions. All right, so ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are both forms of irritable bowel disease. So don't get this mixed up with IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome, because it's not a disease like you would get with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So it's a step above, it's an identifiable cause with these types of diseases. So we're first gonna start with pathophysiology. So pathophysiology is going to tell you how to think on all the other concepts and how to best apply it in your nursing exam questions. Pathophysiology is going to be your foundation of understanding any disease, and it's going to best set you up for success when you completely understand it. To understand the pathophysiology and compare these two diseases, we need to know about the GI system. All right, so what is the GI system and what does it do? So the GI system is a tube, essentially, that goes through our bodies, so it's like the entrance of the internal part of our body. So we have our mouth all the way down to the anus is considered your GI system. So as you know, the GI system is important to absorb nutrients and water. So that way our cells remain happy because they also require nutrients and water. But the main structures in the GI system that you'll want to know about with these diseases is, of course, your first small intestine. So the small intestine includes three different sections. So we got our duodenum, which is right after the stomach. Then we got our jejunum and then we have our ileum. All right, so the ileum then terminates and goes into the large intestine. So the large intestine includes the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. All right, so you guys just need to know about those as these are the main points we're gonna talk about with the pathophysiology. All right, so let's get right into it. Ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. Let's first start with ulcerative colitis. So it's in its name, don't complicate the whole thing. So ulcerative, so ulcer, so what are ulcers? They're actual sores inside the lining of our GI system. And then colitis, so colon, inflammation, because itis means inflammation. So this is a ulcerative, so ulcers in the colon that cause inflammation. So big pointer number one, when we start talking about Crohn's disease, you're going to notice that it's not just the colon like ulcerative colitis. So colitis, when we talk about the colon, it's the large intestine. So we have our ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and sigmoid colon. So any ulcers developing in those is considered ulcerative colitis. So in other words, it's not ulcerative colitis if you have ulcers in these small intestines, for example. All right, so let's go deep into the pathophysiology of ulcerative colitis, and then we'll get into the Crohn's. So ulcerative colitis it is ulcers, so sores that develop in the inner lining of the GI system, so specifically the large intestine, and those sores cause inflammation. So anytime there is an inflammation in the bowel itself, it could potentially cause some issues such as perforation and abscesses that develop. We'll get into what perforation and abscesses are when we go to the complications, but let's keep on with the inflammation. So when there's inflammation or irritation into that inner lining of that large intestine, it's going to stimulate goblet cells, which produces mucus. So think of like COPD, for example. So COPD patients, if you guys have watched our COPD course, you'll see that we talked about goblet cells. So goblet cells produce mucus as a form of protection when there's irritation in the inner lining of that tissue. So when COPD patients have chronic irritation inside the bronchioles, it produces goblet cells and we get mucus that we cough out. So same thing with our bowels here is that there's irritation in the inner lining of the GI system, so the large intestine. Well, there's gonna be goblet cells that stimulate mucus to protect it. But unfortunately, since this is a chronic disease, after some time, there's going to be so much irritation and inflammation that causes that bowel to be rigid and kind of shortened. So in other words, the bowel is going to be less flexible. So when there is stool passing, it's not going to expand like it should. So ulcerative colitis is a chronic disease, but it can come and go. So you're going to have exacerbations and remissions with this disease. All right, now, so let's compare Crohn's disease to what we just talked about with ulcerative colitis. Now, Crohn's disease is also an inflammatory bowel disease, but it doesn't just affect the large intestine. It can affect any of the GI system, so from all the way up to the mouth, all the way down to the anus. But a lot of the times, it's commonly affecting the small intestine, specifically the ileum. So going back to the anatomy, the ileum is the terminal part of the small intestine, so that's a common spot. 
And sometimes that can travel to the ascending colon as well. So that area in general is the most common spot for this inflammatory bowel disease related to Crohn's. Now, unlike ulcerative colitis where it comes and goes, Crohn's disease can come and go in symptoms, but overall with the actual progressiveness of the disease, it's a slow, chronic, and progressive disease in the bowel. So in other words, ulcerative colitis can have increased inflammation and then decreased inflammation. But with Crohn's disease, it progressively gets worse, so the inflammation doesn't necessarily wax and wane like ulcerative colitis. So this is how Crohn's disease develops. There is inflammation that develops in the bowel, and what happens is that creates a focal infiltration of white blood cells and other things that end up creating something called granulation tissue or granulomas. So think of it similar to a twisted ankle. So when you twist your ankle, right, you then get a swollen ankle afterwards. So it's similar to that where there's damage to the inner lining of that bowel, and then over time it continues to keep getting worse and worse with the inflammation, and that's going to cause a mass. Now these masses are pretty variable. They can be scattered or they can be localized wherever the actual issue is going on related to the Crohn's disease. But similar to a swollen ankle, you're gonna have edema that goes there. And because of that edema, you could have potentially a development of ulcerations similar to ulcerative colitis, but this could be anywhere in the GI system. And then once again, over time, because of that inflammation that is there chronically, it causes a bowel weakness, which puts it at risk for perforation or abscesses or even fissures, which we'll get into in the complication. But what also comes from the chronic inflammation is something called Peyer's patches. So that's a key term that I want you guys to remember when we start going over signs and symptoms and diagnostics. Peyer's patches are lymphoid follicles that develop in the small intestine, specifically once again in that ileum is the most common spot with Crohn's disease. So what results is fibrosis and stenosis of that chronically inflamed bowel. So all in all, we have a thicker, shorter, and narrower bowel. So the big takeaway with the pathophysiology differences is Crohn's disease can be anywhere in the GI system, most commonly happening in the ileum and the small intestine. And then ulcerative colitis can only happen in the colon, which is the large intestine. But they have very similar pathophysiology results. They have a thicker, shorter, and narrower bowel, which can end up causing ulceration and perforation depending on where the location actually is. So both of these diseases are actually idiopathic, which means there's not an exact cause to them. But you will find out there are some interventions, especially associated with diet, that can make these conditions worse. And the severity of these conditions can be severely variable. So they could be not so bad at all where they maybe not even know they have it, to it's a very severe condition where they ended up getting surgeries related to these diseases. All right, so let's get into the signs and symptoms between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Let's first start again with ulcerative colitis. So your two hallmark signs and symptoms of ulcerative colitis is left lower quadrant pain. Why the left side? Well, that's because that's your descending colon or possibly your sigmoid colon. Those are the most common spots for ulcerative colitis to develop. A lot of times ulcerative colitis starts in the terminal point of the colon, which is that sigmoid colon, and it can travel upwards. So a lot of times it doesn't start in the ascending colon, it typically starts in the descending colon or the sigmoid colon, which is your left lower quadrant. And then another one is diarrhea. That is bloody and it has lots of mucus. That is a major hallmark sign and symptom that you guys will want to write down. Now other signs and symptoms that are not as specific, but they'll be on your list, is abdominal distension and abdominal tenderness, anorexia and weight loss due to the decreased absorption or the patient might actually be discouraged to eat because every time they eat it causes pain, stool urgency, so stool urgency is more of a specific one to ulcerative colitis more than Crohn's, so that's another one you may want to write down and specific to ulcerative colitis, but stool urgency because of the inability to absorb water and that diseased bowel. So again, you're going to have diarrhea that is bloody and has lots of mucus once again. Now, Crohn's disease is more likely to be right lower quadrant pain. Why? Well, once again, we talk about how the most common spot is the ileum, which is the distal part of the small intestine, which is in the right lower quadrant. Now, if you think about what the small intestine actually does, it's extremely important and vital on the ability to absorb nutrients. So what happens when we have a diseased small intestine? Well, we're going to be extremely malnourished. We're not going to absorb the nutrients that we need and you're going to have lots of weight loss as well. And if that pain is severe, you're once again going to have anorexia because the patient might be subconsciously even avoiding to eat because of the pain involved. These patients can also have diarrhea, so that's another common sign and symptom. Another specific sign and symptom related to Crohn's disease could be oral ulcerations. So as we talked about once again, this can affect the entire GI system, not localized to the colon like ulcerative colitis. Now, both of these conditions can have exacerbations and remissions. So it's okay at one point, and then it gets really bad. So both conditions can have these signs and symptoms be okay, and then also get really bad. They both can have hyperactive bowel sounds, 
So localized to the colon, of course, and then also localized to the small intestine. And typically with exacerbations, they're going to have an increased metabolic rate or they're having an infection that is also a complication. So they might have fever and they might have some nausea going on. And of course, both can have abdominal distension, abdominal masses, and abdominal tenderness. But the big takeaway with this is that ulcerative colitis is more associated with the left lower quadrant pain and bloody mucus stools. And Crohn's disease is more associated with right lower quadrant pain and anorexia, weight loss, and malabsorption. Hey guys, it's Wilker Patrick, nursing educator in Corsetta. I wanted to let you guys know that I will help you with anything you need at any time if you just send me a text at 940-218-4062, 940-218-4062. Let's get back to the video. All right, so let's go into risk factors. So risk factors, so the causes of both of these diseases. Well, a lot of the times when you talk about where it's idiopathic, there's not a direct cause of the development of these diseases. So in other words, genetics and family history is a precursor of both of these diseases. Now Crohn's disease is more likely to be an immune response that is altered, so autoimmune disease. So it could be potentially the actual bowel itself not interacting well with the bacteria sitting in that bowel. But a major one that you'll want to write down is that it is NSAID use as a potential risk factor for development of both of these diseases. Not that NSAID use can actually cause these diseases, but it's more likely to cause an exacerbation with both of these diseases. So typically we like to avoid NSAID use because it's very irritative to the bowel, which if we already have ulcers in the bowel, that's not a good thing to mix in. Now things to avoid with ulcerative colitis specifically is smoking and dairy. So those are two other factors that could cause an exacerbation. So other factors that could cause exacerbations with ulcerative colitis is stress, smoking, and dairy. So make sure you guys write those down. All right, now moving on to complications. So let's once again start with ulcerative colitis. So the big complications that you guys will want to remember with either of these diseases, but specifically ulcerative colitis, let's start there, is that there is a risk for perforation. So that's a complete opening of the bowel, which then of course those contents that are sitting in the bowel then leak out into the abdominal cavity, which is never a great thing. And because of that, that puts them at risk for perineal sepsis, so abdominal sepsis. Now, what else would you expect if the bowel actually perforated? Well, it's highly vascular as well, so you're at potential risk of hemorrhaging. And anytime there is a chronic inflammation to a tissue, you're always at risk for development of cancer. So we could potentially have a colon cancer situation with these patients with ulcerative colitis. Now, Crohn's disease can also have perforation, hemorrhaging, or perineal sepsis, depending on the location. But the most common complications that the NCLEX and the nursing exams love to ask about is the association of abscesses and fistulas. So what is an abscess and what is a fistula? So an abscess is a pocket, you could say, or a space that a bunch of bacteria builds up and it gets surrounded or encapsulated in the bowel itself, which then, of course, could cause lots of complications such as perforation once again because there's increased mass that's developing in that small intestine, and then also fistulas. So fistulas is an actual passageway that should not be there. So some examples of fistulas, so it's a passageway that should not be there, such as an anus that is connected to the bladder, or with our female patients, an anus that is connected to the vagina, or fistulas can even develop from the bowel itself to the external abdomen. So it's a direct ostomy that just developed without even us doing any surgery. Another major one you want to know about with Crohn's disease, we talked about how commonly it's in the small intestine, and the small intestine is very vital to absorb nutrients. So when we have malabsorption, there's lots of other hosts of diseases that can form from that such as osteoporosis. And also the small intestine is a super sensitive area. So if there's inflammation or any sort of blockage in it, it's also connected to something such as the gallbladder. So depending on the location of the small intestine inflammation, it could actually potentially block the gallbladder. So that could develop, of course, cholecystitis, so gallbladder inflammation, or even develop gallstones. So we talked about the specifics of the complications between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but one major complication you guys want to know about that they're both associated with is something called toxic megacolon. This is simply just infection that gets deep into the actual colon tissue itself and then could cause colon death. And that colon death will then, of course, there's necrosis in the bowel itself, which then could completely stop bowel activity. So then you have something called an ileus, so an actual intestinal obstruction. So that is a major one that you'll want to write down with the complications between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. All right, now we're moving on to diagnostics. So diagnostics for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are typically related to the imaging. So the imaging is going to tell you more than whatever a lab could possibly tell you. So it's not very specific to what Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is. 
So imaging is going to be your way of diagnosing. So with your Crohn's disease, typically we will do a CT or an MRI to find those scattered patches that we call Peyer's patches as a hallmark sign of Crohn's disease. Another sign that you like to correlate with, a key term that you'll want to remember, is a string sign. The so string sign is describing that there is a thinning of the actual abdominal wall. So this is also scattered as well. So with Crohn's disease, things are scattered. You have Peyer's patches that are scattered and you have string signs that are scattered. So you could be right next to a healthy piece of the bowel, and then you have a diseased part of the bowel itself from Crohn's disease. So you're gonna have string sign as well, which is just the thinning of the actual bowel wall itself. Now with ulcer colitis, we could do a CT and MRI as well, but a lot of times we like to do a colonoscopy to take an increased better view since it is in the colon. So we are able to actually take direct pictures of the ulcers themselves that could be developing in that bowel. All right, so let's talk management. So the goal of management, so what's the major issue? It's inflammation, right? That could be in remission, and then it could be in exacerbation. So typically when we do interventions, it's in the exacerbation phase. So inflammation is high. So with ulcerative colitis, how do we lessen the inflammation in the colon itself? So what we do is typically give corticosteroids. Corticosteroids will decrease the inflammation through medication. And since a lot of times the pathophysiology is related to an idiopathic or slash immune response, we typically give an immune suppressant. Now diet plays a huge role in managing the inflammation as well. The one thing you guys must write down, this is a huge concept with the nursing exams and the NCLEX, is that you must know they have to be on a low fiber diet when inflammation is present. Why you may ask? Because if you remember fiber, it increases the bulk or the size of stool. So the more bulkiness or size of that stool that passes through that weak and rigid bowel, you're increasing the chances of perforation and all those major complications that we talked about earlier. Another thing with the diet that we might do additional to the low fiber diet is a low residue diet. So think residue as the activity that is needed to digest it. So we want something that is low energy to digest in that bowel because we're essentially trying to do a bowel resting while still giving the nutrition that they need. So here you will see a list of low residue foods that they typically like to reflect on on your nursing exams and the NCLEX, so make sure you guys write them down. And the last thing we'll do with the diet is increase the amount of fluids because what do we not want to happen in the bowel is constipation, which is that hard and bulky stool once again. So we want to eliminate any chance of increased pressure in that bowel wall, so increase fluids, low fiber diet, and a low residue diet. Now, if medications doesn't help the inflammation and a complication ends up happening, then sometimes we'll end up doing surgery, which ends up in a colostomy a lot of times if we're talking ulcerative colitis. Because of course, we're talking inflammation in the colon itself. So if there's a disease part that's just not going to work, and it's going to cause a major complication such as death, then we're going to take out that piece of that disease bowel and then of course reroute it according to what's best for that pathophysiology. So with your ulcerative colitis patients, they could potentially have a colostomy. Now, if you understand the ulcerative colitis management, then you're going to understand Crohn's management because it's extremely similar. Corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation, immune suppressants as well, we'll show a list of those, and then of course the diet. So increased fluids because we don't want to have bulky stool going through there. And of course, especially with Crohn's disease, they're gonna have a malabsorption, so we wanna increase the fluids, and help promote hydration. And a lot of times with these patients as well, they're going to have deficient amount of electrolytes, so we're going to replace those electrolytes as needed. And then if it's severe, then we're going to have to result in surgery. A lot of times Crohn's is more commonly with the surgeries than it is with ulcerative colitis because of the small intestine being involved. So these patients could have an ileostomy because of the small intestine, or they could have a colostomy if it's in the large intestine as well. But the major factor that helps these patients get into remission is those immune suppressors. So the specific nursing interventions that you guys want to know about for your nursing exams in the NCLEX is of course strict intake and output. You really want to watch the output especially because you want to see if there is signs of a GI bleed specifically and how bad is that GI bleed. And you want to monitor the intake because we just talked about it. You want to make sure they're not on a high fiber diet, not on a high residue diet, and you want to promote hydration. These patients also are on daily weight, so make sure you guys write that down. And you really want to monitor for bowel obstruction. So that's one of the complications we talked about earlier, is that nurses must monitor for bowel obstruction. So if there's hypoactive bowel sounds, and then you notice that then eventually it leads to absent bowel sounds, then that's something you really want to address with your physician. Now in severe cases, if we're doing complete bowel rest, you may be giving something such as TPN. TPN is nutrition that is administered intravenous, so there's not anything going through that GI system to do a complete bowel rest. All right guys, that sums up everything with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I hope that helped you guys out. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Hey guys, first of all, thank you so much for watching the video entirely through. It makes our day if we know that nursing school got a little bit easier after watching one of our videos. If you guys like this video, make sure you like it, subscribe to the channel for more, and drop down in the comments for any more ideas that you need help with nursing school. If you want to contact me personally, it's 940-218-4062. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video.